All right, we're continuing our series in Twisted Scripture, and we're going to look at lie number six. You can fall from grace and lose your salvation. How many of you have heard this idea over the years, um, no matter what kind of teachings you've been exposed to? Uh, Somewhere along the way, you heard this notion, this idea, this false idea, this lie that you could mess things up, fall out of God's grace, and end up as an unsaved, spiritually dead person all over again. Is that the truth? Well, today we're going to see that it certainly is not, that God has got you, that you are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus Christ. So let's look at lie number six. Uh, It's perpetuated by this passage in the book of Galatians. In the fifth chapter, it says, You have been severed from Christ, and you have fallen from grace. So that's some pretty strong language, right? I mean, severed, cut off. Well, the original language actually conveys the idea of void of. So whether you're cut off, severed, or void of Christ, that sounds like some really bad news. Then it also says you've fallen from grace. And when we think about that verbiage, I mean, you look at the newscasts, you look at Hollywood, you crack open a magazine and start reading it about celebrities, and it might say something like they fell from grace. Now, In that usage, what they're talking about is that the celebrity was living such a good life, such a clean life, they had some upright living on the outside, and then they did something heinous and shockingly evil, so now their reputation is tarnished, if not totally ruined, and so they fell from grace today when it was discovered that they cheated on their taxes or cheated on their spouse or did some other heinous sort of sin. So the idea of falling from grace in Hollywood, on the television, out there in the media, is very different from what Paul is telling us in Galatians chapter 5. If you're going to fall away from grace in Paul's mind, then you are falling towards something. And in the book of Galatians, we discover what that is. There are people that are approaching the message of God's grace. They're getting close to the message of God's grace. There's a decision on their hands, and yet they end up falling away from that message and going toward a message of law and works-based righteousness. So look at the context here for this challenging passage We ask the question, who is Paul's target audience here? Because that's pretty important, right? I mean, is he talking to Christians or is he talking to unbelievers? Is he concerned about new creations in Christ losing what they have? Or is he concerned about Galatian people who are riding the fence or maybe have already rejected the grace of God and he's urging them, no, give the gospel a second look? Well, Let's answer that question by looking at context. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep how much of the law? The whole law. Remember, the law is an all or nothing proposition. He says, you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. And so there, my friend, there is our answer. This is addressing someone who is seeking to be justified by law, and then secondly, deciding to receive circumcision as some sort of uh, way of getting favor and keeping favor with God. Circumcision was representative of your dedication and commitment to Judaism, your dedication to keep the Jewish law. And so Paul is saying, you foolish Galatians, who has tricked you? What do you think Christianity is about? You're turning circumcision into something when circumcision is nothing? 
and you are seeking to be justified by the law of the Old Testament, well, then you've missed it, my friend. You are void of Christ. This is not someone connected to Christ and then disconnected. This person is void of Christ because they are seeking to get right with God in a way that is not Christ. Now, we see more of this context as we continue in this passage. He says, for we, now notice the change of language, you and then we. Now he's talking about true believers. He's talking about himself and uh, his fellow apostles. He's talking about himself and anyone who through the Spirit knows this incredible righteousness that is in Jesus. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness for in Christ Jesus Look at this, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Whoa. So you guys have decided to get circumcised in your dedication and commitment to the Jewish law. And let me tell you, it means nothing to God. Whether you're circumcised or not, it is totally irrelevant As Paul will say later, the only thing that matters is a new creation. Here, he says, the only thing that matters is faith working through love. And so, we are seeing the we and you language here. You guys out there, any person, any one of you that is seeking to get right with God by your actions, by your works, well, you are totally void of Christ. Why? Because we are the ones who are saved and we know what we're talking about. We, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the incredible hope that this righteousness carries. I mean, our righteousness carries an incredible hope, not just for now, not just for tomorrow, but for a decade from now and for eternity as we get new redeemed bodies to match. So there's a great hope within our righteousness. The fact that we are righteous, the fact that we are made right by faith carries incredible implications now and for our future. And that's what Paul is saying. So please, please, Galatians, come to your senses. Don't mess with this foolishness anymore. There's one way to get right. He is the door. He is the gate. It's a narrow gate. It's a gate of grace. There is one name under heaven by which we can be saved. And that name is not Moses. And it's not about law keeping. So who is Paul's target audience here in Galatians chapter 5 as he speaks these things? He is concerned about unbelieving Galatians who have flirted with the gospel message but have not taken it in. Instead, they have caved. They have caved to the peer pressure of mom and dad or brother or sister or the friend down the street or their next door neighbor. Somebody has said, it's great that you're looking at this Jesus thing, but have you looked at the Moses thing? It's great that you're investigating the claims of Jesus, but have you investigated the claims of Moses? It's great that you've been hanging out with that church over there who believes in Christ, but wouldn't you like to hedge your bet? Wouldn't you like to make sure you find salvation? How about we have a nice balance, a nice mix of Jesus and Moses, of faith and obedience in order to get right with God. And so let's have some faith in Jesus and some law keeping from Moses, mash them together, and we'll have an amalgamation that'll be sure to gain you righteousness with God. And that is what Paul is irate about, this mixed message, this double talk, and this teaching that is coming in on the heels of everything that he shared with them, the the message of Jesus plus nothing else, 100% natural, no additives. And then here come these jokers marching into town, bringing in additives into the concoction. And it's like putting just an ounce of poison in your soup. If someone said, now, you've got a great looking soup there. I've had a taste of it. It tastes pretty good. I've sampled it, but let me just pour a drop of this poison in there. And I think uh, you'll be fine. It's not much poison at all, really. 
Well, an ounce of poison in that soup, and I'm sure you are running for the door. You're not going to take a spoonful of that. And so it is with the gospel. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So how do we know that we are secure forever in Jesus Christ? I mean, it's nice to think that. It's nice to have flowery and warm thoughts inside about a Santa Claus God who just loves us, maybe just loves us no matter what because we think he does or we've dreamed him up. But what does Scripture actually say? How can we know for certain that we are stable and secure and that we have something unshakable and unbreakable in Jesus Christ? Well, let's investigate that as we look at this promise keeper God, the God who is a keeper of all his promises. First, we see in Luke uh, chapter 20, it says, speaking of those who partake in the resurrection, it says they cannot even die anymore. They are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. So we can't die. We are children of the resurrection. You have resurrection life inside of you. Yes, your physical body will perish, but you, the person that you are, will never die anymore. That's incredible to think about. And so if you're reading that today and you know that you're a child of God, you know that you have resurrection life inside of you, then is there any chance you could lose that life? Well, if you lost that life, then you would die. But Jesus says you'll never die. How about John chapter 10? He says, and I will give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I often quote this passage because I love it. It is Jesus offering security to every believer. You'll never perish. Yes, your body will be in a coffin. But as I've often said, right? Maybe you ought to put on your tombstone, I'm not here, go home. <laughs> because you're not there. There is nothing but a body in that casket and you, my friend, will never die. If you are in Christ, you have eternal life, not temporary life, not life until you mess it up, but eternal life because He keeps you. And He says, nobody's stronger than Him. He's got you cuddled up tight, and nobody can snatch you from His grip. You're in the grip of God's grace. 1 John chapter 5, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Man, I love this passage. John is saying everything I spelled out for you is because I want you to have confidence. Look, I want you to have confidence in the day of judgment. But I also want you to have confidence right now. I don't want you floundering around, walking around the planet, wondering, filled with doubt and worry. Am I saved? Am I saved? Am I saved? Am I, still, am I still saved? Did I mess it up? Did I flub it up? What about eight days ago? What about eight years ago? You know, did I do something big or do something too frequently to ruin the contract? Well, we're going to see what that contract is here in just a bit. But you cannot ruin the contract if you're not the one who drafted it, if you're not the one who put it in effect. And so John is saying you can know with certainty that you have a, a brand of life, a flavor of life, that it's not just a paper ticket to heaven. It's not a ticket to heaven and then uh, an invitation to read a book and go to a building for a service. It is deeper than that. It is the life of Christ, what Hebrews calls an, an indestructible life. And you are saved by the power of an indestructible life. Think about that. You will never be destroyed because He will never be destroyed. You will never perish because He will never perish. The life you have will never be snuffed out because it is eternal life. It is His life and you can know for sure that you have it. Wow. 
Ephesians chapter 1 says, In him you also, not just the Jews, but you also, you Gentiles, after listening to the message of truth. See how important listening is? See how important believing is? You listened to the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So look what had to happen. There had to be a messenger. There had to be a message. There had to be some listening. And then there had to be some believing. And after all that took place, the hearing and believing, then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, you think anybody can break that seal? Can a fallen angel named Lucifer break that seal? Now, we're talking about one among billions of creations of the Creator God, Lucifer, who fell. And everybody's making a big deal out of how powerful he is. And he is one of the billions of creations that God created. And he is in a fallen state and he is nothing but a whiny fallen angel who is all bark and no bite. And we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise Nobody can break that seal. Romans 11 says it this way, The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. What does that mean to you? Well, they can't be revoked. Do you have a gift? Man, if you are in Christ, you have a gift. You've got the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of new life, the gift of a new heart, the gift of a new spirit, the gift of unitedness with Christ, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of God's grace, the gift of security and stability in Him, and He will never revoke those gifts, those callings. Do you have a calling? Yes, you have a calling. You are holy and righteous and blameless you have a calling on your life now that you've been marked with a seal. And so the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Whoa! Hebrews chapter 13. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, I'll never leave you, nor will I ever, ever forsake you. Now, most people forget that this is tied to money. But in Hebrews 13, I mean, this passage starts with the idea of looking to money, the love of money. What would money do for people? It would make them less scared. If I have enough money stocked away, if I'm earning enough money, I don't have to be scared. You know what God is saying? He knows there's Believers in the third world laying in a ditch, dying of leprosy. He knows there are believers all over the world who are sincere and eager and living godly lives. And yet they don't have two pennies to rub together. They don't have money. And yet they have him. And that's his point. No matter what happens, no matter what the world does to you, no matter what creditors do to you, no matter what humans do to you, I will never leave you, never desert you, never forsake you. I am your security. Now, what does this say about the prosperity gospel? I mean, the prosperity gospel says that if you're trusting God, you're going to get more and more and more money. And this is saying, if you're trusting God, you have Him and He's enough. Now, there's nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money. There's nothing wrong with uh, earning dollars and putting them in your bank account. But there is something wrong with looking to money as my security and stability. And so, this is an assurance passage. The author of Hebrews is saying, don't put your confidence in your bank account Put your confidence in your God who loves you and he'll never ditch you. He'll never leave you. You can trust him. You're safe. And there's nothing like safety, especially when it involves a promise from the God of the universe. I'll never, ever leave you. First Peter 1, Peter writes and he says, We are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. When are we going to see everything in the last time? 
Do we have to worry about it being ruined from this day until then? Do we have to worry about it being mucked up, that being, being messed with, being withdrawn or revoked between the time that we were saved and the time of that last day? No, why not? Why don't we have to worry about that period of days, that period of time? Because it is protected by the power of God, not by the power of our behavior, not by the power of our own protection, but protected by the power of God himself. You know, Peter also says, that this inheritance we have is reserved in heaven. Are you worried about missing out on your inheritance? Are you worried about messing it up and getting less? (laughs) It's amazing how many Christians are focused on reward and inheritance. And Paul says the reward of our inheritance, well, it's the same thing. Reward of the inheritance. And then Peter says that our inheritance is actually not on earth where we can mess it up. It's reserved in heaven, undefiled, Peter says. So we don't have to worry about somebody messing with our salvation, somebody messing with our inheritance. What do you do to get an inheritance anyway? Do you do a bunch of great stuff to get an inheritance? No. An inheritance is when somebody dies. They croak. And then in the contract, it says because they died, you inherit something not based on your merit, but based on their death. And that's what an inheritance is for us. Who died? Jesus How many times did he die? Once, because it worked the first time, and as a result, he rose from the dead and now has an inheritance for you and me, reserved, undefiled, in heaven, protected by the power of God. You don't have to worry. This is not a carrot and a stick. God is not saying, here it is. Hope you come to this level. Hope you reach and arrive at this state, and then you can get the good stuff. He's not dragging the stick throughout our lives, dangling a carrot of potential reward, a a, a carrot of potential inheritance, saying that I hope you're motivated by this to live a good life. No, God has done it backwards. He's turned everything upside down. He's given us the salvation first. He's given us the inheritance guaranteed first. And we'll never lose it. And he wants us to be motivated by our equipping and motivated by his love that is irrevocable. What do you do? How do you react to a God who says there's no strings attached? I'll I'll never ditch you. I'll never abandon you. You can't flub this up. You can't ruin this. Friend, that warms your heart toward that God. Rather than walking on eggshells, worried about losing something, you get inspired and motivated from within in a whole new way. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, Therefore, he is able to save, how long? Forever, those who draw near to God through Jesus, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I want you to notice, you'll be saved As long as Jesus makes intercession for you, you'll be saved as long as Jesus lives to make intercession. How long is Jesus going to live? He'll always live. So how long will you be saved? You'll always be saved. It is that simple. He is able to save us forever because Jesus lives forever. End of story. Now, Notice that your salvation, the length and the quality of your salvation, the length of your life is tied up in the length of Jesus' life. So it's not about your living. It's not about the quality of your living and your lifestyle. It's not about how much you're living for God. It's about His life and the endurance of His life. And as I said, Hebrews tells us that That life is powerful and indestructible. And you know what that means? That means that your salvation is powerful and indestructible. John chapter 6 says, And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those He has given me, but raise them up at the last day. How many people is is Jesus going to lose? None. 
How many people are going to lose their salvation? None. Well, who said so? Is that my opinion? No, John chapter 6, Jesus, the Son of God, says it himself, I shall lose none of them. Now, you have to decide, is Jesus lying? Has Jesus got it wrong? Does he have misinformation? Because he says, I will lose none of all those whom you've given me. So apparently we're safe and we're secure. And you know what? Did you notice those that he has given me? Wow. I mean, Jesus is looking at you like you're a gift. You're a gift from whom to whom? From the Father to the Son. You're a gift from God the Father to Jesus the Son of God. That is some wild stuff right there. Waking up every day going, yeah, I'm a gift. I'm a gift to Jesus. I mean, we're happy to say Jesus is a gift to me and Jesus gave me a gift, but I'm a gift From God the Father to Jesus? Huh. I mean, that sounds arrogant. That sounds off base. I shouldn't go there. I shouldn't think that. Well, it's not because I've done something, but it's just the way that Jesus looks at us. He's saying, thank you. I mean, in a prayer, he he actually gives thanks for us. Thank you for all those that you have given me. Whoa. So what is the promise of our security? I mean, what is this contract that I spoke of earlier? Well, here is this promise. Here is this contract. Hebrews chapter 6, it says, Because God could swear by no one greater, He swore by Himself. Now just try to fathom that. That God couldn't find anybody surveying the earth, if you will. He couldn't find anybody as powerful. He couldn't find anybody as reputable. He couldn't find anybody to strike a deal with where he was certain that they would keep up their end of the bargain. I mean, think about it. He'd, He'd already seen what Israel would do. He already knew about Israel's performance under the law. And his conclusion was, And I turned away from them, says the Lord, because they did not remain faithful. And so he saw all the promise keeping of Israel, and it wasn't any good. He saw the dedication and commitment even of those priests. And he ends up chastising them for their lack of commitment the priests of Israel. So whether it was the the layman, whether it was those who were offering sacrifices, whether it was the priests, it didn't matter. All of Israel, there was none found to be truly faithful in keeping the law. And so God is saying because He couldn't swear by anybody on the planet, anybody in the universe, physical or spiritual, He swore by Himself. So he promised himself. Now, you know, I I was a kid and when I swore to God, I got in big trouble. But apparently God can swear to God and it's okay. And that's exactly what he did. He swore to God. God swore to God. Hebrews 6 puts, puts it this way. In the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise. Notice that security there. The promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose. So this is never going to change. I'll never quit on you. He interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, what are they? God and God, in which it is impossible for God to lie. And by the way, it's also impossible for God to lie. Two things. We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have right now as an anchor for the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. In other words, access to God. Pure and perfect access to God. Looking behind the veil like nobody could do before. Jesus was the forerunner, and God promised God. So, as I like to say, in this corner, hailing from all of eternity, the God of the universe, and He is no liar, He's a truth teller and a promise keeper. 
And in this corner, hailing from all of eternity, the God of the universe, He is a truth teller and a promise keeper. He is no liar. And then we see that these two, God and God, these two unchangeable things come together, make an agreement together so that it will never be broken. And you, my friend, will never lose what you have because of Him. We have this hope, not this hope of me and my performance and how am I doing, how am I doing. No, no. We have this hope, God and God, as the anchor for our soul. So what is anchoring you, my friend? Is it your promises to God or is it God's promise to himself? Conclusion, what do we see? We see from Scripture in one way or another, over and over, this. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. You say, well, wait a minute. I know He can't deny Himself, but can He deny me? Where does He live? Where does He live? In you. And he cannot deny himself, and he lives in you, so he won't deny you, even when you are faithless, even when you are doubting, even when your emotions are all over the place, even when you are confused, even when your performance is way off. He remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, and therefore he will not deny you. What did we see today? The lie... You can fall from grace and lose your salvation. I don't think so. What did we see? The truth, the truth of the matter is that you will never lose your salvation. It is kept for you, undefiled, protected by the power of God, reserved in heaven. It's eternal life, not temporary life. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. Nobody can snatch you out of His hand. Even when you are faithless, He remains faithful. Now let's give thanks for that. Father, we thank You for Your promise, the promise You made to Yourself. We thank You for not involving us. We would mess things up, Father. We thank You that You are our anchor for the soul that it's all about you keeping a promise to you. We have entered into that rest, and we are grateful, Father. All we can do is say, wow, and thank you. We thank you that we are stable and secure, that we benefit from the power of an indestructible life, the life of your Son, Jesus Christ. We brag on Him. We look to Him. We depend on Him. We trust Him, Father. We believe. We believe that you have given us something unshakable and unbreakable and that you preserve it yourself in your mighty hand. In the name of Jesus, we pray and celebrate together. Amen.